Jen, the Zero Waste Manager at World Centric, and happy International Compost Awareness Week. Uh, we will be talking soon with Napa Compost um, about their operation in Northern California. So once again, I am Lauren Olson, the Zero Waste Manager at World Centric, and we'll be talking soon with Tim from Napa Composting, and they are an industrial compost site in Northern California, and um, they're doing wonderful things to help return stuff to the soil. Waiting for uh, Napa Recycling, and um, we will start our discussion. Hey, Lauren, can you hear me? I can. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> Pretty good. Are we doing all right? Good. Uh, so I'm Lauren Olson, the Zero Waste Manager at World Centric. Um, we make compostable food service wear, and we're here for International Compost Awareness Week, I think is the order of the words. Um, <laughs> and I'm here with Tim. Uh, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, so I'm Tim Jimmy Mattia. Um, I work for Napa Recycling Waste Services. So we um, operate a composting facility in Napa, California. We actually operate another one in Yolo County, um, kind of just north of Davis, California. And um, we're a hauler um, in Napa. So we pick the stuff up and we process it at our facility kind of from the beginning to the end. So been working in organics for a while now. Yeah. Um, so you want to just give us a quick background. Like you started um, in the zero waste sort of thing back in college. Um, like what was your major? What got you into that? Or <laughs> You can't really major in recycling and composting, right? Although maybe you should be able to. Um, um, yeah, did you do environmental science? I, or I, I did. I mean, I actually was a geography and history major, but I studied a lot of environmental science science and I was interested in the environment and I kind mm -hmm. of when I needed an on-campus job it was like I don't want to sit in a library or behind a desk um, I actually got a job sorting recyclables and driving a truck we had a little mini Murph so I went to college a little small college in Vermont Middlebury College a little liberal arts, mm -hmm. liberal arts college and uh, we had our own Murph on site we had a truck we'd collect recycling and sort it on a really basic little Murph um, on, on site on campus and I did that for four years and we even and they actually have a cool composting operation it's a cool little site for a small school and um, you know after I graduated um, I did a year of AmeriCorps moved out to San Francisco and did a year of AmeriCorps working on uh, community recycling projects with uh, the San Francisco Conservation Corps and then um, and other nonprofits in San Francisco and work started working in Napa in 2005 so I've been doing zero waste work for you know, over half my life now. And I've been working on specifically at our composting facility for almost 15 years now. That's great. Yeah, um, so let, tell me more about uh, Napa Recycling and Compost for people that don't know. And yeah, just so for people also, yep. it's in Northern California, um, right in wine country. Right. Uh, <laughs> so it's cool because our facility is, you know, right, right in wine country, but also one of the closest into the Bay Area. Our facility is actually located less than a mile as the crow flies from the San Francisco Bay, from where the Napa River hit, hits the bay. So it's kind of cool because we're right, we're not out there, we're right in the middle of the Bay Area, but still kind of in the edge of wine country. So our facility at that site opened in the early 90s and composting has happened there since around 1997. And at first it was, you know, yard trimmings, yard waste, and the grape pumice, so the seeds, the stems, and the um, skins from the wineries after they crushed the grapes. Um, so we've been composting that for, you know, since the 90s. And, um, you know, as things evolve, as organics programs develop, um, we started looking at food scraps and um, started doing some pilot projects actually around 2008 where we were taking food scraps um, from some commercial customers. And it was working great. And we got our permits in line. And so 2014, we rolled out our full food composting where we could accept, you know, food scraps, uh, food soil paper, certified compostable products, kind of mixed in with yard trimmings and um, kind of adding into that grape pumice and everything. So um, we do about 100,000 tons a year of total material at this point. Wow, that's a lot. 
yeah. funny because it's actually, um, you know, we look at our tons and people think about recycling in which we actually, we operate a recycling facility too. And we haul garbage mm -hmm. um, and we do construction and demolition. So all the material streams, um, organics are the biggest amount by tonnage wise. If you look at our residential customers, um, mm. the amount of organics, you know, in those carts is more than recyclables or the trash. So it's the biggest fraction. You know, our customers in California, we're, we have a climate with year-round growing seasons, right? So there's yeah. yard work happening all year round, but then also there's all the food scraps and they're heavy. I mean, so your garbage is not as heavy as your food scraps. So I think that helps with it too. So it's certainly a lot of material. Yeah, um, that's great that you're able to do that year round. I know um, I lived in Michigan for a long time and we're really not blessed with that year round agricultural different. cycle. Yeah. So it's, you can it's do it, tough. you can do it, but it's hard to get <laughs> close here. And you don't have a lot of yard turbines to mix it with those food scraps in the dead of winter, for sure. Yeah, it's a more of a seasonal thing. You just got the fall and maybe some spring cleanup. Yeah. Um, so what type of systems does a facility use for composting? Right. So we, um, you know, started with open windrow system and did that for up until just last year. So we, um, we just finished um, a new kind of state-of-the-art aerated static pile system. It's fully operational as of January 2020. Um, I'd love to be there right now, but I've been working at home doing the shelter in place. So um, once it's opened up, we'll, We'll have to do another t virtual tour and, and show you around the site. So um, the aerated static pile system, it's designed by ECS, you know, a pretty um, big designer of composting systems. They're located up in Washington state. And um, it's got the, you know, in-ground um, piping that, and then the concrete floor and a concrete pad. And um, it aerates through pipes. There's about 3,300 little spargers, little pipes that come up, aerate the piles. Um, we have sensors that go in and uh, measure the temperature, the amount of aeration, and um, we water them with hoses and have a whole system of monitoring the temperature. You can actually pull up a smartphone app and uh, look at the, the temperatures in the piles and the different areas. Um, so, you know, the, the, the system is actually fairly simple. It's still aerating. It's aerobic composting. Um, but it's a little bit more efficient at aerating the piles, giving them the right amount of oxygen. You kind of know it better and you don't have to turn the piles, right? We don't have to open them up and use our loaders to turn them all the time, which is more odor and more VOC emissions and things like that. So this is kind of where we're at with composting technology now. It's taking what we've always done with a, you know, a, a composting, which is natural system, natural process and made it a little bit more efficient um, to work in our systems as we go forward. Yeah, it's kind of like your backyard sort of lazy pile method on steroids, really, in terms of yeah. monitoring and adding, you know, air and moisture as needed. I mean, it's the same as backyard, except it's, you know, it just, mul it just speeds it up, right? So and that's why people yeah. say, well, how can you compost, you know, meat, bones, you know, mm -hmm. cardboard products, all these things in, in your pile? I mean, you could do it in your backyard. You just got to worry about... Um, <laughs> you know, pests and, and it would take forever, right? So, um, you know, yeah. our material gets hot fast, kills pathogens, um, and it's, um, it's a little bit more of an efficient system, but it's not any different. The, the, the little microbes in there are the same microbes that would be in your backyard. It's, we have a lot more of them because we have a big pile and we're pumping air into it. We're giving it all that juice, right? All those steroids. Yeah, and with the aerated, um, your particular aerated static pile system, you, you know, you'll be able to monitor with your smartphone. Is it automated in, in terms of when it adds oxygen? Does it just do that, or is there like a manual? It's both. Right? You, can, you can set it up to um, to kind of look at how much oxygen and what the temps are, and um, you can give it a whole basically um, process and plan that out. But you can manually override. And I know, like our operations folks are still learning the system, right? It's only been operational for operational for a few months. And so they've found mm -hmm. it kind of both ways, but they're, you know, as they tweak it, use the manual, then they can set it up to be um, kind of more automated as it goes forward, for sure. Yeah, so maybe one day we'll have robots taking over this whole industry, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, I mean, it's it's robots and people, because it's, you know, we, it's interesting, we have to have more, we have a couple more employees that are doing the, um, the monitoring and all the temperature logs that we have to do for our air permits. And um, we have a new testing system on site. So it's gotten a lot more high tech, the work, but mm -hmm. 
You still have to have people, but the robots help too. <laughs> so it's both <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Um, so you already mentioned this, like um, how much organic material you process, but that's like a hundred, hundred thousand tons um, 100, 000, yeah. of material. And then can you explain a little bit? Um, I know we've talked before and you mentioned like how much of that ends up being wet. And then in the end, it's, you will have a certain amount that yeah. you get. Right. There's shrinkage, right? I mean, that's actually, yeah. um, well, first of all, we pre-process. So you re remove contamination. I mean, luckily our contamination for, our organics is like 1%, which is not as bad as our recycling and the things, but that's still, you know, you get plastic, unfortunately, and concrete and all kinds of stuff. Um, and then we'll try to remove the wood fraction because wood takes forever to decompose in the composting system. So instead we take the wood and we send it out for biomass, renewable energy. And so then you have the part that goes into the piles and then, you know, you have evaporation, a lot of evaporation. Um, happens with hot compost and, um, you know, mass loss. And so, and then at the end you screen off, um, you know, the big woody parts of the rocks and the other contaminants that were in there. So, you know, we're end up, we're looking at like 40,000 cubic yards of compost a year, but actually we're hoping that our new system will be able to kind of increase slowly over time, the amount that we make and sell. Cause our compost, we're fortunate. We can find buyers for it. We have markets for our material. And um, we think the mo if we can make more high quality organic compost, we can keep selling it. There's not a, there's not um, a problem with finding people who will use compost. And I think when people realize all the benefits, you know, it's International Compost Awareness Week. Like there's a lot of benefits using compost for our climate, for soil health, um, all kinds of things, erosion control, um, adding those nutrients back into the soil. Like there's ways to use compost that we haven't even scratched the surface on yet. Yeah, let's talk about that a little more because um, I don't think, um, you know, in the, it's in the public's view that about compost and its effect on climate change. Um, do you want to speak to that a little bit more? Yeah, people like have a hard time with thinking that their garbage, right, their little food, their icky food stuff is actually a beneficial material. And it's not even like that it's just the beneficial thing that we can sell. It's, it's extraordinarily exponentially beneficial to the climate, right? So when you put organic, you know, food scraps in the landfill, gives off methane. There's a lot of, been a lot of press about this. Methane is a hugely potent greenhouse gas, you know, maybe 75 times, depending on how you measure it, as potent as carbon dioxide. Um, to take that out of the landfill, and instead you make a renewable product that goes back into the soil, right? Adds nutrients to the soil, adds carbon into the soil, more root structures, grows food. This is all part of the natural carbon cycle, right? You grow things and you eat them or you, you, know, you make compost and you do it again. That carbon comes out of the atmosphere. So um, it's highly beneficial when you reduce your usage of um, chemical-based fertilizers. Those are a huge greenhouse gas emitter. So if you look at all the benefits of compost um, it, and, you, and you start to educate the, the population, people don't really realize that, right? Um, then you start to get an appreciation and that aha moment. And then you get people to participate, right? You get them to actually divert their food scraps. And then they want to use compost in their gardens, um, in their farms, in their landscaping projects. Right now, a lot of people are planting gardens because of the shelter in place. People at home, victory gardens. Um, this is compost is perfect. You make compost at home or you can buy compost from your local producer. Like we saw a lot to home gardeners or to garden centers and things like that. So... It's great. I mean, the more you talk about compost, I think people all have to get excited about it. Yeah, it's um, been really nice um, to get more into compost and compostables um, compared to when I used to work in recycling. Um, because, you know, as we've talked about, the recycling market is just such a, a downer, yeah. you know. Um, right. And I'm even more worried about it with the um, price of petroleum, you know, hitting rock bottom yeah um you know it's gonna be very difficult for recyclers in the future to compete against this very um cheap virgin feedstock right. um and i wonder if you wanted to speak to that a little bit in terms of you know what's going on with re recycling and then maybe you know the benefits of composting um in particular because it can be done obviously on site and not have to be shipped somewhere right and i think like I'm not going to bash recycling, right? Recycling is an important part of our business, oh, too. But I course. will say that compost it makes me more um, 
I, I, I'm more like, I'm more hopeful about compost. I think like there's a lot, it's a lot of ways where recycling has been around a lot longer. Compost shows some a lot of composting, organics diversion shows a lot of opportunity. But um, one of the things about recycling is that it involves manufacturing um, typically not locally, right? So um, we'd love to have more manufacturing um, in the US or in California. And there actually is a little bit more coming back because China stopped buying recyclables, but most of our recycling is shipped overseas or long distances. And it's dealing in international commodities markets and right oil production and a lot of different like issues right now. And a lot of problems with contamination um, and sorting. So um, when you look at compost, right, we, we've never shipped compost to China. Um, although I will say we have had people ask us about shipping why, you know, Napa Valley Cabernet compost to, <laughs> to overseas. Um, although those business plans never really panned out. I mean, compost is a locally made, regionally made product or regionally used mm -hmm. product, right? And so we're selling into like pr places within our, with generally within a hundred miles. And um, it's going back into that soil, right? And it's not having to be manufactured into a new product. And so in some ways it's a lot simpler than recycling. And so if you can get people, it's new to a lot of people though. So um, if you can get them to kind of understand all the reasons and how to do it, I think it's easier than recycling. There are fewer rules um, and there's a huge opportunity for you to get all this stinky, stinky stuff out of your trash bin, reduce your trash um, and put it back into compost and mix it in with those yard trimmings and make a product that you can add right back into your soil. So um, I think it's the, the it's, I'm optimistic about composting for sure um, going forward. And we have a lot of directives in the state of California that I think are just going to keep pushing it forward. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, all the, the organic diversion um, initiatives going on are really going to, to push more composting operations to open up or expand. So that yeah. should be. And I will say, like, I did say I'm really optimistic, but unfortunately, we've seen in the last, you know, with this crisis, like New York City just stopped their organics collection program for budget reasons. And it's going to be really critical for um, people, like just individuals to go out and push their um, their cities or local leaders on why it's important to keep, to start and to keep and to maintain these composting collection programs. These organics programs are super critical to our greenhouse gas reductions and they're actually pretty cheap when you look at like the dollars spent per you know metric ton of carbon they pull out of the atmosphere it's way cheaper to get everybody to compost than for everybody to buy an electric car right electric cars are very are great but like they cost a lot more than, than composting and i think there's just a lot of education that needs to be um done to in the full picture of why you know organics diversion and making compost this amazing product a natural product. Um, this just needs to be more people pushing for it. It needs it needs it like needs people to be excited talking about it. It needs its big fans out there for sure. We're out there, but we need more. We need more of you. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, I mean that's a big concern. Um, you know, with the uh, economic downturn. Um, you know, in New York City being an example, but you know, as like cities or states, you know, uh, budgets are getting tightened um, due to, you know, lack of sales tax or just a lack of income coming in and more people needing employment benefits. Um, certainly something we saw in 2008, too, with the uh, recycling, right. you know, and um, so what are some ways that people um, can get involved in um, advocating for composting, like if they wanted to make sure that their composting program either stays in place or they want to see some changes like expanding it or um, the amount of materials or something like that. Yeah, and I think it's like if folks have the information, the information is really um, powerful and it's just getting that information out. And I think working with community groups is really important. So I think it's like you tie the environmental group in with community groups in, in different parts of your community. Um, the business community um, and, and kind of have all these groups and kind of talk about, you know, what's the reason for them? Like, why is it important for, we talk with restaurants and about, you know, they're interested, a lot of them are interested in farm to table sustainability and also about saving a little bit of money. So it's on both ends and we can kind of work with them and make it so that it, they save a little bit of money on their garbage bill by diverting 
food scraps. And then you have your community groups, you have your information, you got to go to your elected officials, right? I mean, those are the folks who are going to make decisions and um, make it important to them. And, um, you know, on the, pro on the facility end of things, you need to have a place to do it. So home composting is a great way to start. And I think people should be doing that if they don't have access to, um, you know, a, a curbside pickup. And even if you do have access, it's great to make compost in your backyard still. Um, kind of trying to get that infrastructure in place. So there's probably someone in your community who's making compost. They may not be doing it on a big industrial scale, but they're doing it through our businesses all throughout the country, all throughout the world, making compost. And um, you know, talk to them or talk to places, you know, neighboring communities about their facilities and try to figure out where the infrastructure, like where the stuff's gonna go and get those folks involved in the discussions too. And then, um, you know, talk to the haulers, right? The people who are picking it up. So kind of all the stakeholders, once they know about the reasoning and the information, um, there's not a lot of great reasons to send all this great material, this organic material into a landfill instead of making compost. And I think that's like how you put, you piece it together. Cause, and then of course, you know, you get, eventually you get some legislation and you make it mandatory and then boom, like we <laughs> we're, we're now, now our industry is kind of, you know, we're established, right? This is an important thing and it's going to keep going. And for us, it's a business that even in an economic downturn, you would never want to, you never think about stopping it and sending all this material to the landfill. That would wait, that would actually cause the city of Napa and our company to go out of business <laughs> if we sent all of our organics to the landfill, because this is part of our business model, local sustainable mm -hmm. business model. Yeah, it would probably be extremely expensive considering all the agriculture out there. No way you could <laughs> put all yeah. that in the landfill. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so your facility accepts compostable packaging. Um, and this is, you know, something we'd love to see everywhere. Um, but what sort of technology and systems did you have to put in place to accept these materials? Um, you know, it's really important when you're accepting kind of anything, really anything other than the basics, yard trimmings, is to have systems in place at the front end and the back end to deal with contamination. Because once you start to expand out and to accepting um, food scraps, grocery store material, restaurant material, um, composable packaging, you're going to get confusion or you're going to get stuff that's in plastic bags and things like that. And so um, we have pretty robust pre-processing systems. I think it's critical. Um, you know, we've invested in a depackager for commercial um, food from grocery stores um, and other commercial businesses and industrial food material. And then we have um, we have screens, sorters um, on basically like a mini sort line and where there's a couple of sorters to pull out contaminants on the front end. It's a lot easier to remove something that's not compostable on the front end before you grind it into little pieces. So you'd see if you were on our sorting line, you'd see plastic bags, you know, bottles and cans, um, you know, things from the yard, ball, you know, tennis balls, um, soccer balls, <laughs> garden, a lot of garden tools <laughs> and bricks, like bricks and concrete, um, but plastic plant, plant pots, a lot of just plastic, like that people put mm -hmm. in, it's everywhere, plastics everywhere. So try to get that out on the front end. And then you have your, you have your grinder, you size reduce any it's a size reduction chopping in a little bits is important if you're going to get something to break down in the process and then at the very end you still have to screen off the stuff that doesn't you know that either didn't that didn't compost and some of that's wood or rocks i mentioned and or tennis balls but some of it would be plastic and things that kind of got through your system so it's front end back end um quality control because you don't want to have pieces of plastic um in your finished project product for a lot of reasons um so that's the thing you, you know if you're going to be accepting kind of a, a wider mixture of materials um you need to have i think on the front end and the back end systems in place to deal with the stuff that you didn't want um, and it gives you an interesting um, picture of what you're getting like what you're seeing um through the system too so you do learn a lot so that's the biggest thing it's pre-processing and then the post screening yeah, um, so these facilities that don't accept like compostable packaging, do you think it's a matter of them just not having the pre-screening abilities put I, in place and the grinding? I think that's part of it. Um, the pre-processing is something that we invested in that's fairly unusual, um, and but I think it's really important and necessary. You know, as we look at 
moot getting all these things out of the landfill, um, you need to have some flexibility and you need to have pre-processing if you're going to get there. Um, you know, it depends. There's, you know, there's not one size fit, fits all for composting. Um, you know, we're a, we're a sort of a large scale, um, you know, kind of com uh, con you know, commercial composting facility. And we sell bulk product typically. There are some boutique composts that are very amazing product made from specific materials that, you know, they may just take, you know, wine grapes and, you know, redwood shavings or whatever it is. And they make a product that is great and it costs 10 times as much as ours. Um, so I think there's not a one size fits all. But in a lot of these like kind of um, these commercial systems, if you're going to have a lot of you know, compostable products and food and grocery store material and take out containers in there, um, you need to have pre-processing. But we also have to have um, important regulations in place for like things that sneak in there. So it's like the PFAS are a big thing, right? Um, you know, yeah. that stuff you can't tell on the sorting line if a piece of, of a paper board is coated in a, in a chemical, <laughs> in a nasty chemical, right? So that's where certification of products, and I talk about BPI certification is excellent example. So when a customer says, I want to use these plates or, you know, this container, um, is it BPI certified? You know, that's, that's um, a great way for us to tell that that's something that we think is going to do okay in our process. Yeah, and then there's like these look-alike products too that really mess everything up, like these, you know, these craft paper boxes that are actually lined with plastic, but right. they look sort of eco-friendly-ish, you know. They, and they say it's very, it's, yeah. <laughs> right. you know, it's it's confusing as a consumer as well as yeah. obviously a business owner because these restaurants are buying them. For some well, reason, and that's you know. thing, right because we, you know, we're we're picking up the material, we're hauling, and so we're working. We're working with the city and the county staff or outreach to with these businesses and they're kind of looking at hey i want to like use this takeout container um you know it says eco-friendly <laughs> right and mm -hmm. and what does that mean and kind of wading through that and so yeah I mean, terminology is critical and kind of having it be consistent and you know i understand with brand branding is tricky but we're always going to be like i, I Ideally, everything that's compostable has a green, you know, compostable. <laughs> it's it says it on there where where someone can see it, and like not that little triangle on the bottom of a plastics that means nothing, right? We're talking about something that actually had a. If we're going to move to compostable packaging, right, if for your granola bar or whatever, it has to somehow mm -hmm. let you know that it's compostable. Um, so those are things that can be mandated through regulation um, at some point because I don't. I don't know where else it's going to come from, right? If it's if it's not done that way, so that's what we're looking at. If we're really going towards a place where we don't have single use plastics, we have hopefully as much reuse as possible, and then we have mm -hmm. you know compostable food packaging for stuff that's not reusable. Um, then we don't have to worry about single use plastics anymore. But in the meantime, we're going to have to have really good yeah. labels. Yeah, it's this in-between period that's going to be very frustrating for um, right. for people dealing with the waste because we're already for, all these yeah, we're products already, out there. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. I think we've covered most of our questions. Do you have anything that you would like to talk about? <laughs> um, well, yeah, I was actually kind of, you know, since we're all sort of in this, you know, COVID-19 era, um, mm -hmm. you know, what – what are you thinking, you know, how's world centric looking at any opportunities that come out of, I mean, we're all going through a hardship right now. I'm sure you've lost business, right? There's no, there's no concerts and events for us to go to, to use it. So, you know, what are some yeah. any lessons that you're seeing on it um, about, you know, kind of being in the compostable products field? Um, well, I mean, everything's going to take out. So there's that. But you know, um, I think we're all seeing that, you know, some restaurants are just not gonna be able to survive this. Like I read this heartbreaking article about, you know, after this, are we only going to have big corporate chain restaurants that are gonna be able to survive? You know, and I certainly hope not. Because right. I mean, you know, local restaurants really make or break the yeah. community, they really bring people together. They're great meeting places. So um, you know, that is a big factor and, um, you know, certainly we're not going to see, like you said, concerts and maybe, you know, I don't know if colleges will start up yeah. in the fall. 
Um, but you know, like someone pointed out, you know, we have relief efforts. Um, we have all these, you know, (laughs) all these meals going out to hospitals and medical workers and things like that. So we're supporting the community the best we can because we do donate 25% of our profits to, um, either nonprofits, um, abroad, they're helping with extreme poverty and we do a lot of product donations. Um, so yeah, something we're seeing is, yeah, more, um, requests and we're trying to help as many people as we can. Yeah. I mean, we've noticed like, I mean, we work, you know, obviously we have a lot of like great local restaurants and, and food and hospitality in Napa. And there's a lot of local restaurants that are having to pivot and go to takeout. And, you know, our, so folks that we work with, um, have been kind of coming to us at the city or at Napa Recycling, um, you know, kind of having to reconfigure their service. But then also there's an opportunity where they're like, hey, I'm going to take out for this stuff. Like, what containers should I use, right? <laughs> like, because it's something <laughs> new. Um, and, you know, you say, well, here's, you know, you can go to certified compostable products. Um, and, you know, so going forward, hopefully they'll reopen and be able to go in and sit down. But, still you know they'll be we've gotten them to kind of in the door with kind of getting away from single-use plastics um and we're talking to them and i think people are we're gonna have to go and have a conversation when stuff when stuff slowly opens back up but you know they're already thinking about ways to save and ways to kind of um be able to get better going forward so that's a little silver lining is just um kind of being able to talk to our restaurant and and lo- mostly it's the local ones too, right? Who are the ones that we have had as our champions because they're going to be typically not always. You know, some of the chains are doing a pretty good job of composting, but um, it's generally the local ones that um, are the ones who are more sustainable and using less of the single-use plastics. Yeah, I think they're usually the kind of the bellwethers, kind of going out first and really set, paving the ground in terms of sustainability. These, you know, these local restaurants who who really care about their community. Um, but yeah, I mean, it should be um, interesting our our new world going forward. You know, because we'd all love to see you know reusables, but I can't even bring my reusable bags to the store. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's 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 only. It's only temporary. We have, and we, but you have to like be vigilant, right? Is that mm-hmm. don't let um, the petroleum industry kind of use this as a reason to get everything single use plastic. And I think, I think at this point, people are sort of educated enough to not let that happen. But it's don't let our, we can't let our guard down. It's don't, don't try to sneak in with, with all, with more plastic. And, um, you know, oh, definitely. we've, I think we've kind of gotten enough headway on this that we can't let it go away just because of, um, of this. So people are going to have, we're going to have a lot of community, communities rallying around each other, trying to recover and, you know, making compost in having local jobs and, um, putting it back into our soils and reducing emissions, kind of keeping our, you know, emissions are reduced now with like nobody driving, but let's keep that going forward, right? Like not just everybody get back in and go back to business as usual. So let's hope that we can kind of drive it more sustainably um, going forward. Yeah, and I'd really like to see, um, you know, like our all of our lives changed in a matter of a couple of days, right? Yes. Um, in terms of <laughs> this whole shelter in place, yeah. like it was like, oh, it's coming, but it's probably not going to be here. Oh, okay, I guess I'm going home, you know? Right. So, so um, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, we're still alive. I mean, stress, but we're alive, right? So, you know, yeah. I would like to see us kind of bring this into climate change too, because it's another, you know, sort of thing that scientists have been war- warning us about forever. Like, hey, this thing's yeah, coming. Just like the you know, we really got to do something about it. Like, yeah. if we don't do something now, it's just going to get worse. Yeah. You know, really, we all got to rally together. We have to change society. And so I would like to see us learn from this and be like, well, you know, if, we can do it to to save lives in the short term. Maybe we can do this to save lives in the long term. Yeah. And, you know, it, we're just going to have to do it and it's going to be hard and there's going to be some growing pains and we're not going to like it for a little bit, but we'll get through it. And in the end, we'll be better off for it. Right. That's a true. It's interesting, right? We're getting some practice for that um, because that's something that we're going to have to go through for sure. Uh, but hey, I'm, I mean, I think it's, 
you have to be optimistic about it. And I think actually composting helps you be optimistic. The cli climate and the crisis is huge and it's overwhelming. And actually, if you look at mm -hmm. composting, I think that's like, hey, this is how this is a success, success story. This is one of the things out of many, but this is something we can make more compost. We can do all these awesome things with it. We can put it on rangeland and reduce emissions. And there's all cool mm -hmm. things. It's not just growing food. It's also sequestering carbon in soil roots. It's usually what the Marine Carbon Project has doing a lot, been doing a lot of awesome work yeah. on the Bay Area. So um, I think it's there is some hope. And I think, hey, composting is part of that. Definitely. Um, well, that's a great way to end our conversation with all the hope of compost. Um, so tomorrow at 3 p.m., um, I'll have my final Instagram interview with Rashi Kumar, um, the environmental educator at Kiss the Ground, uh, based out of L.A. Cool. So thanks again, Tim, from Napa uh, Recycling uh, and Compost. Is that the technical name? Uh, for joining me today. <laughs> um, love to see what you're doing. And um, yeah, let's uh, keep the hope alive for composting. That's right. It was good talking to you. Happy, <laughs> happy International Compost Awareness Week. Yes. Happy International Compost Awareness Week to you too. <laughs> oh, love the time. Okay. Take care. All right. Bye.